My name is Nancy Allen, and welcome to Sci-Fi Universe. Hello, Miss Nancy Allen. Uh, we are today at the Neuchatel International Fantastic Film Festival, and we would like to know what does fantastic cinema represent to you? Well, I think it's, uh, you know, film is all about illusion and dream and fantasy. This, is, to me, is the ultimate, because there's really no boundaries, yes? You can, anything you can imagine, you can explore in this genre. There's no limits. So, um, it's, I guess it's the ultimate. And in your career, you, you represent a, a truly great icon of the American horrific uh, thriller, and you became a scream queen in only two films. <laughs> what did make you feel like? <laughs> to be a scream queen? <laughs> to become a scream queen so fast? Oh, well, it, I guess uh, I feel very fortunate that I had uh, the parts that I did. I love, I love the genre, obviously. And um, I guess I'm always surprised, you know, oh, you're so screen queen. It's, I'm always surprised when uh, people see it as uh, important because, you know, I just, I didn't think about it so much when I was doing it. I just, I liked the script and um, I didn't think it would become such a huge important piece you know you just want to play different roles and here you are <laughs> doing this kind of genre so but I it's it's wonderful wonderful and to be respected you're talking about different roles but in uh, these two films Dress to Kill and Blow Out you uh, play uh, a cold girl who witnesses a crime and eventually dies uh, for having seen that is it uh, something strange playing the same role in two different films in uh, well, two different ways. I, I understand why you would see it as the same role. I saw it very different yeah. characters. Um, because in Dress to Kill, she is a call girl and she's taking money for having sex with people. Um, the character in Below Out, she thinks that she's being more of a detective and then she's getting information so that people can get their divorce. So, in her mind, it's a different thing, but I understand the same thing. I tried to make it clear that that wasn't the same yeah, because you, I don't, I don't want to repeat the same. And I think the character in Dress to Kill is very smart. You know, she knows what she's doing, and she's um, oh, very materialistic. And the other girl is more simple-minded. I think she's very kind of naive and. You know, she wants to do makeup, and she thinks she's going to be doing movies. You know, she's just in her own yeah. world. So I tried to contrast it a little bit, find the differences. But it's it was difficult because, you know, the way the part's written. So I had to find... So there was only one college. year between the two films. And the yes. Basics, uh, yes. With the evolution of the character, uh, witness a crime, and dies eventually. This yes. The funny, funny thing about this. I was not going to make that movie, Blowout. I was never supposed to make that movie. Okay. Um, in fact, uh, the characters were written, the original script, the characters were written very differently. They were really written for two older people who were kind of broken down and, you know, t cynical and just older and really had been through a lot. And, um, and there was a list of actors more like... Um, James Woods, or you know, more of kind of like an intellectual kind of actor, and um, John just happened to call. I was actually I was in Paris, and uh, I was there doing press for Dress to Kill, and uh, Brian says, "Oh, John Travolta called, and he wanted to read the, my new script." I said, "Well, well, what are you going to do if he likes it?" because it was not written for something. He said, oh, no, no, it's not for him. He won't like it. So sure enough, he liked it. And I said, well, now what are you going to do? Now what are you going to tell him no? And he said, well, no, I can't do that. It changes, yes. the, changes the whole movie. And uh, I said, well, you know, he's totally wrong for this character. I don't know what you're doing. So I was arguing with him. And he says, oh, you think so? Well, he wants to do it with you. <laughs> now what are you going to do? I said, well, I say yes, of course I'm going to do it. So we then, um, because it was so different with the two of us, we started to do improvisation. 
to try and now find these new characters. So we we worked all these improvisations, and then Brian rewrote the script so it was fitting more to okay. John and I. And did you take part in a way in writing? Well, just in the improvisation, just through finding to help to find the characters. He used some of, like for instance, the whole thing about wanting to do makeup for movie stars. That just came in a, in an improvisation with John. I don't okay. even know where it came from. Just just saying, yeah, you know, I want to do makeup for movies, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Because the, the couple, uh, John and you, in the film, uh, works perfectly. It's, uh, it seems really written for you too. Yeah, no, and then it was rewritten for us, but of course we have such good chemistry. Yeah. John and it. I, so it, it worked. Chemistry. Yeah, yeah. And an uh, obligatory question at the end of the out, is it your own screen? It is my screen. Yeah. 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 You don't want me to scream now. <laughs> we'll scare everyone. <laughs> And then I won't be able to talk. <laughs> and uh, still on Blue Out, what do you think of your last sequence with the great deal of emotion? Fireworks in the background, this circular traveling, Pino Donaggio's music, it's just... It's magnificent, yeah. isn't it? Very, yeah. very magnificent, spectacular to watch, and um, much more beautiful. None of that was in the script, originally. It became, it, it became bigger. Uh, when uh, the cast changed, I mean, having John Travolta and and John Lithgow and John Lithgow, what a wonderful actor! He's so tall, you know. He was throwing me around like I was a rag doll, <laughs> like this. And uh, Brian kept saying, "Keep tough, strong with her, strong with her." He says, "I don't want to hurt her," <laughs> but I just have to say, with all of the fireworks and the music, and of course, uh, Vilmos Zygmunt. Uh, the cinematography is beautiful. beautiful, absolutely beautiful. It was shot uh, in front of a blue or green screen? Well, some of it was shot actually in Philadelphia on location. Okay. The closer shots, like when, when you see him bringing me up the stairs, that's all in Philadelphia. But then when you come in closer and we're um, on a stage okay. and then they're shooting. The camera turns around. Uh, yeah. yeah. In only five years, you worked with such great directors, uh, Brian De Palma. Robert Zemeckis, Steven Spielberg. Uh, have you can choose? Paul Verhoeven. Yeah, yeah. Just the, the <laughs> oh, just in the beginning. Your, yeah, yes, yes, yes. Step by step. <laughs> yeah. So you, you you were in your early twenties at the time, and how did it make you feel working with these great directors? Well, uh, you know, I have a instinct. It's like when you meet the director, I can always tell yes immediately if they're going to be good. I feel I go a lot on my instinct. I felt immediately safe. And great directors, it's a wonderful collaboration because they are, well, they're creative, they're open minded. And even though they're very specific how they shoot their movie, they always are open for the actor to tell them more about the character. So if you say, for instance, with Steven Spielberg, we were shooting on 1941, we were shooting something, and he said, now I want you to do this like this. And I said, oh, I was thinking like this. And he said, I said, well, what do you think? He says, I don't know. Let me see. So we did it both ways. He said, you know, you were right. So a good director is a great collaborator. When you work with the sort of mediocre directors, they're very sure, no, only this way, only like this. They have a very uh, narrow view. Uh, they're not as confident, I guess. Or maybe, maybe not. But I, I have to say, I was... It's a bless, blessing and a curse to work with right way in the beginning with great directors because then when you don't, it's terrible. Yeah. It's <laughs> you know? the best beginning in a way oh, yeah. to, to do uh, this work of actress. Oh, yeah. Wonderful. Do you have conscience at the time that this film uh, will become such success? Yes. Yes. I, knew, I don't know success. I knew they would be good movies. Okay. Because you can tell. When you're working, you can feel. When, when you read the script, when you shot them. Well, when you read the script, you know if it's a good script. But when you're on the set, if it's a good script and you have a good director, it has. Um, it's kind of like a machine that's just going and it's easy and everything is working together. Um, so it feels you organically. You just feel that it's good and if you're lucky to see a little dailies a little of the dailies but um, and the difference is when you're not on something when the script is kind of okay and you're on the set you can feel it's just it's not working and the lines don't come and it's always harder 
Right. So, so you know, yeah. yeah. <laughs> okay, and so at the time you represented a new kind of beauty in American cinema, truly genuine, but not so innocent, a uh, new part. So, were you aware of your impact on the male sex? No, <laughs> I wasn't. <laughs> I'm even a little. Really? No, yeah, no, no. I did. I don't think I was. I think I was. Um, I was uh, insecure, somewhat, and uh, shy a little bit. So I could be more aggressive, more daring in the part than in my own life. <laughs> okay. Thank you. So now, 1987, you played Anne Lewis in Robocop. Did you know Paul Verhoeven's Dutch work before this part? I knew Soldier of Orange. That was the only one. Then I saw his other movies. And I remember seeing that and thinking, this man is brilliant. Yeah. Brilliant. So I wanted to work with him. Very excited to meet him and possibly work with him. The script was really greatly written. The script was perfect. Okay. It was perfect. I picked up the script and I saw Robocop. I thought, oh, terrible title. They'll have to change the title. Yeah. <laughs> I'm sure. So that, I called my agent. I said, they're going to change this title, aren't they? <laughs> and so I thought, well, I'll read a little bit and I'll read the rest later. I picked it up. I couldn't stop reading the whole thing straight through. It was smart, it was innovative, uh, funny. You know, very clever, very clever, yeah. and it had a lot of humanity in there. You know, I, visionary for the time, uh, really visionary, just brilliant. So uh, I wanted to make this movie. I thought I have to make this movie. Okay, and a funny thing in the first sequence of Robocop, you beat a guy in a very manly way, mm -hmm. and this represents a radical transition with your past characters. who were all very sensual and elegant. What could you tell us about this? Well, that was exciting for me uh, because it was a very different character and no one would ever see me in anything outside of this feminine kind of character. And um, my father was a policeman in New York and I thought, ah, you know, I know about a cop, I know how they think a little bit. And um, I really thought that it would maybe open my career into different possibilities. Um, I was wrong in a way. I was right that it was different and wrong in that it, it really confused people in yes. Hollywood. They like you to kind of stay within a, a formula, if you will. But um, it, for me it was a fantastic experience. I mean, I think it's... Uh, you cut your hair. Ah, uh, <laughs> seven times. And it was seven all times. seven times because he cut the hair, so I cut the hair and it go shorter and then cut. And I had seven haircuts from four different people. It was the worst hair ever, ever, ever. It was no hair. It was horrible. And I kept saying, "I'm fine. It's okay. No problem." And then all of a sudden, I went, "Oh my God! I couldn't believe what happened." So. Um, so it was in a way a um, mm -hmm. conscious change to change your, your image. Yes, and I think it was it was coinciding with I was changing, and it was representative of what was going on with me. I was really transforming myself uh, and who I was. I had been through my divorce. I had been through um, just enough change in my life, and uh, it was uh, it was really like saying, "No, this is who I am. You're not seeing me." Now see me. Okay. Mm -hmm. and maybe How did you prepare yourself for this uh, really physics spot? Well, I did go to the police academy, which was wonderful. I got to shoot guns, which I loved. I'd never held a gun before. You know, all my life I grew up, my father always had a gun. He would put it there and then no one would ever touch it. I wouldn't touch anything. So the first time I held the gun, I was a little nervous. And then I started to shoot and I had... Um, at the academy they have the target practice and there's certain drills that they do so I got to do them and I was very good <laughs> I was very good <laughs> at it and the, the Steve Estrada who was training me he trained the recruits he says you're very good you, you could be a good cop um, so I did that and I learned a little bit how to to fight, fight. but I did from the um, uh, the trainer on the set as well so it was it was fun and you enjoyed it I did I did
I've always been physical, but more of a, a dancer than a fighter. <laughs> so you are a really complete actress. And how do you work your characters? Uh, have you got any tips to arouse emotion in the audience? Uh, how do you work? Um, you know, it depends on the character. I try to, when I first read something, I try first to identify something that's personal that I can bring of my own experience to a character, a kind of a the method, if you will, and finding things that I can uh, relate. Uh, sometimes I use, if there's something emotional, I use different things. Sometimes I use music to... I always actually usually relate some kind of music to a character okay. and uh, to get a, you know, kind of a the representing the feeling or an emotion and also um, a memory of something uh, that's your, affecting me, yes, or if I'm looking at you, I'm looking at you, but I'm seeing someone else and yeah. a feeling. Is it frequently, if a script is written very well, you don't have to do very much because it's very honest. It's a very... It talks to you, uh, it invades you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then the image of the character, uh, to me, sometimes I just get a, I get, sometimes I'll get like a visual idea of what the character looks like. And that gives me, you know, if you look at someone and you see how they dress or how they wear their hair, you immediately have an impression of them. Yeah. Yeah? So that would help me, like, if you put on the costume and then you do the hair and you go, oh, there's the character. It's kind of like becoming, transforming yourself. But you have to get... The internal work too, otherwise it's not very honest. Mm -hmm. On a set, you work with talented actors and directors. And could you tell us about your best encounters in, in what you what you did? Uh, I had great great actors I worked with. Of course, the greatest directors they have you know Brian and Stephen, Robert Zemeckis. It was his first movie. Yeah. Um, and Paul was a, was incredible. And uh, Eric Rochon. The Patriot. I loved him. I met him the first time and I, in, in uh, California, and we just talked about the script, and then I left and I went, I have to work with him. So I called my agent, I have to see him again. And I go back, I said, I have to make this movie. <laughs> so, um, you know, I, those are the directors, the actors, John Travolta, John Lithgow, Richard Dreyfuss. Um, who else did I work with? Else I work with? Who can remember? I can't think now. <laughs> well, um, even I loved working with Michael in um, in uh, Philadelphia Experiment. I had a good experience. Uh, I, I've been very, very fortunate with the actors. Thank you. And maybe to, to conclude, we we miss you a lot. So, have you plans for new films in the near future? Well, you know, I don't. Um, I have a, made a very big change in my life. Uh -oh. For almost, it's going to be the 10th year, it's kind of like the 10th anniversary, the 10th year I've been working almost like a life's work, a passion of mine, working in um, uh, Wendy Jo Sperber, who had made two movies with me, I Want to Hold Your Hand in 1941. Mm -hmm. She was diagnosed with cancer in 1997, and in 2000 she came to me and she says, oh, I, I want to open a center, a healing center. And you know all about yoga and all of these these alternative things. Can you help me? And I said, oh, just, okay, a little bit. So for the last almost 10 years, I've been working, creating this, this healing center. And um, it's very important. It's like a life's work to me yeah. at this point. I lost both of my brothers, and it sort of changes how you feel about things. However, that said, if a good movie... We say, here you went, I say, okay. Oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Maybe cinema's changed too and it's not so good as before. Well, I think it's some good and then some, I mean, it's, some things are wonderful and innovative and terrific and then some like that. I don't know if it's It's on the changed. industry which is yeah. changing. I think a little bit. I mean, it, when I started in the 70s, independent films yeah. were um, the wave of those whole, all those directors, all those wonderful filmmakers in that period. 
and it's a little bit uh, well Hollywood's always Hollywood isn't it it's always big and You're right. studio and there's always wonderful young independent directors and I think that's why this kind of a festival is so great because you get to see mm. those kind of movies again you know which are not the gigantic studio pictures so or in not only blockbusters movie also yeah yeah there's and there's a you know there's a there's a place for that but I really like um, I think when you have the smaller picture and the independent that's kind of like that guerrilla filmmaking yeah. something always good comes from that because it's for a very pure reason it's usually because people love movies and the directors they love the movies and the res the studio pictures reason. is for money 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 <laughs> you said everything yeah <laughs> thanks a lot my pleasure mm -hmm.